For those of you here in the house, uh, I'm glad that you are here to participate in worship this morning. Are you glad? Amen. Man, it's a great reminder that uh, the church is a people, a people gathered, a people that are different from different places and different ethnicities and different cultures and different financial statuses and and different perspectives and different all walks of life, but yet God, through his blood and the baptism that we have in him, make us one. And we get in a room and we have an opportunity to express our love and our devotion and our desire to worship the Lord together. He begins with his Holy Spirit to unite us, and so it's wonderful. So if you're at home and you were thinking, well, I don't know about that, well, get here and find out, and I promise you, uh, the Lord will encourage you as well as the people that you will sit next to. So thank you for being an encouraging church this morning. If you are here, and as you saw in At the Park, we have this in your seat back. We'd love to connect with you. There is a way to connect and give some prayer requests. There's a way to connect and look at our our website, as well as to do digital giving, which I understand is a popular choice, and I appreciate you guys for looking into that. It helps us, especially those of you who are sustainers and continual contributors, helps us to keep moving forward and doing the things that God's called us to do here at Parkwood as we build beyond and as we do uh, ministry in this community and in this world. I uh, am in a series with you uh, called Woe. Everybody say, Woe. That's just one way to say it, right? Then you can say, whoa, right? Or whoa, right? There's a bunch of different ways. It's one of these words that have a bunch of different meanings. And, and depending on how you say it, uh, I was uh, watching, I uh, kind of enjoy uh, Jimmy Fallon. I know that may put some of you at, off a little bit, but I think he's funny. And he has a little skit that he does with different people. And they say, eh. Ew. And you might have seen that or whatever, and they do it different people. And it's, ew, it's one of those words that can mean a lot of different things, right? And we find that slang often does that. And woe is a word that has a lot of different meanings depending on how we say it. And we're seeing that here in our passages. And last week, we started in this woe, City of Miracles. And the theming, if you have our devotional, it's kind of this 90s theme. Or if you saw that, you might even saw, if you were here in the 90s, we put a couple pictures of people that grew up here and were participating here in the 90s. It goes really fast because we didn't want to embarrass anybody. But uh, I have been trying to wear things from the 90s. And so this shirt is from the 90s. The last time I wore it, it buttoned, so uh, it doesn't button now. These shoes are from the 90s. These are the Air Jordan 7s, which were the Dream Team 1992 Jordans. Uh, Those are awesome. My uh, friend Nick gave these to me. Uh, When I was in the 90s, I had like British Nikes and like Pumas. I didn't have Air Jordans. Closest I got to those uh, in the 90s was uh, a pair of uh, primetime shoes that I got. I had a pair of cleats that were uh, prime time, our Deion Sanders. Then I had a pair of shoes with blue flames on the side. I thought those were pretty cool. But I am also trying, even though I broke the rules, I have a little hole in these jeans. We don't want to do that on our stage, but, but these jeans are from the 90s. I got them buttoned, but I'm not really cool about sitting down in them. They're the last pair of real denim jeans I have. You know, real denim jeans don't ever go out of style, and they never really tear up unless you tear them up and it just makes them cooler. That's kind of how it works. Uh, I, uh, I love um, the 90s. I grew up in the 90s. I was a teenager in the 90s. If you were alive in the 90s, say yeah. 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 See, if you were not yet born in the 90s, say oh yeah. Yeah. yeah see, if you would have been born in the 90s, you would know that there's life that comes from the 90s, like some cool stuff, right? And you were growing up, but you were probably born in the 2000s, which makes you really lame, and I'm sorry for that, okay? If you don't know what lame is, you can Google that. That was a word we used in the 90s, like, whoa, right? So uh, I, I just say that in jest because we want to connect with you. There, wherever you were born, the whole series, this idea is really about miracles, Miracles. Miracles are one of these things when we see them, we can encounter them. When we, when, we, when we read about them, it really does make us go, whoa, wow, amazing, as that song Amazing Grace alludes to. And last week, 
I really pressed hard and I wanted to, and if you didn't see it and you want to watch it online, you can catch up, but I pressed hard into this idea that if you want to experience a miracle, if you want to see a miracle, if you want to acknowledge a miracle, you first must recognize the sovereignty of God and the authority of God. If you do not recognize the sovereignty of God, his dominion over all things, his, that, that there is no place his power and his wisdom and his might and his presence cannot be, then you'll never be astonished by the works of God because you always attribute those things to chance or you'll attribute those things to some kind of thing that humanity brings about. And if you don't believe in the authority of God, then you're never going to respond to his will and never really going to participate in that, because authority, that's where the power is. And we're going to look at that a little bit today as we move into, if you have a Bible, turn with me to Matthew, Matthew chapter 9. You will not see it on the screen this week, Matthew chapter 9. If you have a digital Bible and you want to read along with the same version I'm reading, I'm reading another Christian standard Bible. If you have another translation, you're going to be able to interact with that translation similar to what I'm reading. Uh, but most modern translations will read similar. If you have an older translation or a more literal translation, uh, there'll be some words that are a little bit different. But I believe if you can read English or you can hear English, no matter what translation you'll have, you'll get the same kind of context. I want to start with reading verse 1. So it's Matthew chapter 9, verse 1, and I'm going to stop at verse 3. So it says, So he got into a boat. He is Jesus, crossed over and came to his own town. This is that town of Capernaum. It's this town we're talking about all this month. It's this town where Jesus is kind of residing and connecting, town of Capernaum. Just then some men brought to him a paralytic lying on a stretcher. Seeing their faith, Jesus told the paralytic, have courage, son, your sins are forgiven. At this, some of the scribes said to them, said to themselves, he's blaspheming. Now, I don't know about you, but that kind of catches you off guard. Here's a guy who says, hey, your sins are forgiven. Doesn't sound like that big a deal, right? We should forgive sins. We should forgive other people. But there's something interesting that happens here, immediately, these scribes, these people who understood the law, they understood the legal context of the law, they knew what the law of God was saying, this law that was handed down to them from Moses, they knew something that maybe we don't know. And so I want to help bridge that gap a little bit. If you go to Exodus chapter 34, Exodus chapter 34, Exodus, if you're not sure where it is, Genesis is the first book in the Bible that most of you have. Exodus chapter 34. Exodus is the second book, and it's a giant narrative that explores the formation of the Israelites or the Jewish people. It helps us to understand where the laws of God come from and how the being faithful to God is connected. And we have this chapter, chapter 34, and it's a story that some of you might be familiar with. Maybe you saw a movie called The Ten Commandments, or maybe you, you've seen other uh, shows, or you've watched or read, or you've learned about this, or maybe you've just heard this in passing, kind of cultural lore or knowledge. There's this guy, Moses, who was leading the people out of slavery into a wilderness and towards a promised land. And in that time, he was leading the people. There were times when the people got disgruntled, but God continued to show his favor and his faithfulness. And they got to this place called Mount Sinai, which is a mountain in the area of Palestine area and, and outside of there, uh, I guess, modern day like Iran, uh, this area. So we have this people that are camping down the mountain and God calls Moses to go up to the mountain and this is where he's going to give him all their laws, all their rules, all their decrees. He's going to make himself more known to the people of God and he gives these 10 commandments. These 10 commandments become the foundation of the Israelites and, and while Moses is up there, 
these people who came out of a place where there was a bunch of gods and a bunch of different beliefs, they began to be distressed and worried because their leader was gone for a long time and they didn't feel like they had the presence or connection with God. So they started making their own gods and they started worshiping their own gods. This one is the golden calf and, and they began to, to, to give offerings and sacrifices to this golden cow. And when Moses came down with these laws, he did what any person who had been in the presence of God and then confronted with, with evil or wrong intention did. He got really ticked off and he threw down the tablets, cracking them and busting them up. And then in his anger, he said, what are you doing? You're, you're ridiculous. So you're, you're just messed up. Don't you know the same God who took you out of here and, and brought you to safety and the God you're supposed to have faith in and everything? He's there and he's told us to live a certain way. And here you are going back to your old ways. Right? I, I resemble that sometimes. I have faith in God, but life takes me in a different direction. I start doing things maybe that I shouldn't. And I start to live a different way. I start to not resemble the faith that I once had. And so they're reprimanded. Moses goes back up. I mean, can you imagine going back up to God and be like, dude, I broke the tablets, right? Good thing he sees all things. He already knew it, right? But I would just feel like, man, when I broke my grandma's vase. I was ashamed to tell her. Can you imagine breaking God's like laws and going up back up to him saying, I need a do over, right? But he does that. And so then we, we see what happens and where this comes from. Exodus chapter 34, Verse four, Moses cut two stones a tablet like the first ones. He got up early in the morning and ta taking the two stone tablets in his hand, he climbed Mount Sinai just as the Lord had commanded him. Verse five of chapter 34 of Exodus, the Lord came down in a cloud, stood with him there and proclaimed his name, the Lord. The Lord passed in front of him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord is compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love and truth, maintaining faithful love to a thousand generations, forgiving iniquity, rebellion, and sins. And at this point, Moses is thinking, whew, thank you, Jesus, right? No, he didn't say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God, right? That's what he said. Thank you, God. And here he is. God finishes this thing in, in verse seven, this statement that he's making, but he will not leave the guilty unpunished, bringing the father's iniquity on the children and grandchildren to the third and fourth generation. Oh no. Moses feeling the weight of this entire thing that Jesus, that, that God has just said that, hey, I'm faithful and, and, and I'll remove sin and, and I'll forgive but I will not, I will not just let it go. I'm gonna be a God who punishes iniquity. And it's not just gonna be on you, it's gonna be all those going behind you because we need to get this straight. You need to be a God that, I mean, a people that only worship me. And look at what verse eight happens. Moses immediately knelt low on the ground and worshiped. Then he said, my Lord, if I have indeed found favor with you, my Lord, please go with us, even though this is a stiff-necked people. Forgive our iniquity and our sin and accept us as your own possession. So what basically Moses is saying is, can we just go with the first part? We are God who forgives we are God, even in your justice, through your, own, through your own devices, will you be a God who will look past our stiff necks, our rebellion, our, 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 our drift towards sin? Will you, will you be a God who will forgive us? And what does God do? God says, yes. I will be a God that does that. And I will make an agreement with you and the people. And if you follow what I'm going to command, if you do those things, I will always be with you. But if you don't, I'm not going to be with you. This commandment, this covenant foreshadows the work of Jesus, where Jesus comes and he becomes what we call the new covenant, the new agreement in which Jesus comes as the forever sacrifice so that everyone who believes in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord receives that limitless forgiveness and compassion and love. 
And that, that wrath, that, 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 that righteousness, that, that, that justice, that, that, that anger that can still come on us, Jesus bore all of that so that we, no matter how many times we sin and fall short, when we continue to come back to Jesus, when we continue to come back to God and believe on him, we receive the forgiveness of God. And so there's this grace that comes on us who believe in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. So there's no place that we can hide from God anymore that we can't receive his forgiveness and his love. This new agreement I give you this because this little passage where God says, the Lord is compassionate and gracious, verse six, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love and truth, maintaining faithful love to a thousand generations, forgiving iniquity, rebellion, and sin. That passage and then what follows are the Israelites begin to understand and they begin to build this doctrine. What is a doctrine? Doctrine is a fancy word for saying a belief, an understanding about God and the which way he works, and it's my way of understanding it and proclaiming it. And they began to understand very early on at the formation of the Jews that God is the only one that can forgive sins. He's the only one that can take away the wrongdoings. He's the only one that can take away the shame, the guilt, the baggage, all of that. Only God can do that. And there'd be nobody that would disagree with that. And then here we are, Matthew chapter nine. Jesus steps into this moment, a moment that he's been in before in front of people that he's been in before. I mean, this is Capernaum. They've already seen dozens of miracles. They've already seen Jesus do things and they're like astonished and they're amazed. And, and then he says to them, your faith, their faith, I forgive your sins. At that moment, you would think amazement, astonishment. Wow, we thought God was the only one who could forgive sins. And there's this man who, who we see who has done amazing things. I mean, I mean, just in our town, we, we, he, he's, he's, he's brought a, a child back to life. He, he brought a, a fever off of off of a mother and, and, and he, he, he healed people and he, he removed demons from people. We saw that, we're amazing. And now this one who's done these amazing things to this physical bodies, wow, he can forgive sins. But instead these people, these scribes, they didn't really understand the sovereignty and the authority of Jesus, did they? In fact, they saw a great amount of limit there. And because they believed Jesus to be just a man, no matter how amazing he had been, no matter how many things he had done, they didn't believe in his full sovereignty and his full authority. And so immediately they thought, blasphemer. You think you're God. There's no way you could be God. And then we see a shift. We see chapter four. Perceiving their thoughts, Jesus said, <laughs> Why are you thinking evil things in your hearts? For which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? Good question. I mean, here we are. We, we have these people who he's speaking to, speaking specifically. You have thought something in your heart, in your mind, but my authority and my sovereignty, because I am the son of God. I am three in one, the Trinity. I am, I can read your mind. I can read your heart. And so out loud, Jesus calls them, calls them on their stuff. You've been there when somebody called you on your stuff, right? You know exactly what you were thinking. Most often I grew up with that fear as I'd go into the kitchen to get one more thing out of the refrigerator, one more snack. My grandma, who I thought was asleep, would be like, ah, 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 what are you doing? It's almost dinner time, right? How'd she know, right? Or, or maybe it's something else, looking and doing something, your parents find out about it, or, or, or maybe, maybe some of your, your kids call to you and they say, look, this is what I know you're thinking, mom, but that's not it. 
dad, this isn't it, or a coworker. You've been called out before. You know what it feels like? So Jesus calls him out, makes a show of it, and then offers this challenge, this challenge to assert his sovereignty and to assert his authority. Which is easier? To say your sins are forgiven, right? Something you cannot see, something only God would know, or get up and walk. See, the first miracle that we see here is that Jesus, seeing their faith, Jesus forgives the sin of the paralytic man. I love that there, their faith. You've heard the story where they would pull the, pull the, the roof off and lay the, the person, the man down in front of Jesus to heal him. This is there. Isn't it interesting? We, we see the, the times where, where it was by her faith, specifically when the woman touched the garment of, of Jesus that she was healed. When the centurion just walked in, he said, because of your faith, right? Because of your faith, your servant is healed. But here, Jesus says it's because of their faith. If he was from the South, he just said, because of y'all's faith, right? Y'all. So I ask you a question. It's really the first question. How is your faith in Jesus helping others to receive forgiveness? What if your faith could impact someone else's ability to receive forgiveness? I think it does. I mean, even Jesus, when he teaches us to pray, he says, forgive them their trespasses as I've forgiven you. It's almost like an invitation. It's an invitation into a community. It's an invitation into a relationship. And in in our church, especially, how often are we people who our own faith in God and Christ, how God has loved and forgiven us, how is our own faith allowing others to experience and know the forgiveness of God. You see, that first miracle is that it was their faith and then Jesus healed the paralytic man. What a wonderful opportunity for us to ask the question of our own faith and how we can impact the forgiveness of others. Next, we we see a second miracle, right? That Jesus perceived their thoughts. Their thoughts. Nobody likes to be lumped together, especially in the age of of, uh, individuality, right? But in truthfulness, most of our thoughts are very similar to the very person we're sitting next to or across from in this very room. Most of us still deal with those same insecurities, those same frustration points, those same hurts, those same deals. We might not verbalize them. We might might not declare them, those anxieties, those worries, those concerns about our life, those concerns about our future. We we might not, not express them but they're there. And how our thoughts often condemn us, right? Our thoughts in our own minds condemn us and call us to to question here. Here's what I'd like to ask you in this miracle. What internal thoughts in your mind need to be corrected to align your life with the will of God? What internal thoughts do you have? Because we're talking about how, how are we going to be able to people who are witness miracles and have miracles in our life, right? If this is, whoa, Capernaum, city of miracles, here are people that saw miracles, but the scribes, the scribes failed to see the miracle of the forgiveness of sins. How many of our thoughts of judgment, of condemnation, of that those people are not worthy. Those people don't, don't have what it takes. Those people don't belong. Those people don't vote like me, think like me, look like me. How often are those internal thoughts, that thought of my own pain, my own victimization, my own hurt, that limits me from offering forgiveness to those who have offended me? How often do our internal, internal thoughts keep us from seeing the miracle of forgiveness in the life of others. If we have that question and we answer it, 
and we begin to adjust it, then we can align ourselves with the will of God and we begin to do what God's called us to do. It becomes a little bit easier to love those who are in level, to love our enemies. One of the hardest things to do in this time. Then we have this last section. Start at verse five. For which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? And now Jesus shows, I'm about to show you my sovereignty. I'm about to show you my authority. I'm about to to give you something here. But so that you may know, this is verse six, but so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he's lumping it together now. He's he's connecting the dots from this this thing that happened with Moses and God extended out his forgiveness and he was known as the only God who forgives and he's the God who will extend out his forgiveness. Jesus now is taking ownership and saying, I want you to know that same God who spoke up on the mountain during the redo of those 10 commandments that same God, that's me. And I have authority. And I'm gonna show you how my authority forgiveness of sins works. I'm gonna show you in this moment. Then he told, this is the second part of verse six. Then he, Jesus, told the paralytic, get up, take your stretcher and go home. Verse seven, so he, the paralytic, got up and went home. When the crowd saw this, they were awestruck. Whoa. Whoa. Awestruck and gave glory to God who had given such authority to men. Whoa. He can heal. Whoa! Wow. He got up and went home. Immediately we see the one who understands the authority of God obey God. Get up and go home. Other, other places we see Jesus say, hey, go and, and tell the priest or, or go and do this. But here, just get up and go home. I don't know how long it took you to get here to this this beach in in Capernaum. I don't know how long it took your friends to carry you. I don't know how big you are, how little you are. I don't know any of that, but I know that, that this was a man who was laying on the ground who the first miracle that he received was the forgiveness of sins. The second miracle that he receives, the second miracle that he receives is the restoration of his body. And now we have a God who has also spoken and heard the mind of the people. So in this one moment, Jesus produces that he is sovereign and he has authority over the mind, over the soul, and over the body. In this one instance, Jesus is declaring that there is is no limit to the power that God has given me. And in this moment, in this moment, what are the people, what are the people amazed by? The body. The body. That's That's where the greatest miracle was. Man, this dude, he couldn't walk. But yet his his body is now restored. Whoa! Church, isn't that how we work sometimes, right? We look at all the world and we see these things and we're looking at these, we're looking for these giant things and and every day, small little miracles in which God has called us to participate in, even being the the place in which we, we pursue and produce and give miracles just by giving the very thing that God called us to do, which is to love and to encourage and to offer forgiveness and to go beyond ourselves amazing miracles in which we have the opportunity to produce the grace of God living and breathing into our world to give some sort of 
life and hope to the world, yet many of us are standing back and not acknowledging the work of God on an everyday basis because we're looking and hoping for that giant miracle. And what do we do? We praise that giant miracle. We get them on testimonies and we put them in front of TV and they get to be all over the place and say, man, this person was dead and they rose. They couldn't walk. They were up. And man, we need to, we need to do that. We need to support that. And yes, but what I want you to see, what I want you to see in this moment as Jesus healed the body of the paralytic man, and we rejoice, but in this story, Jesus did a miracle to forgive the sins of this wounded life. Have you received the miracle? Have you received the miracle of forgiveness of sins? Have you received the, the miracle of having all of your, your stains and your guilt and your pain and your burden and all the wrongs you've ever done and all the things you've said and all the hurt you've ever caused and all the, the things that you've stolen, all the things that you took away? Have you, have you received the miracle of forgiveness of sins? If you have, are you rejoicing? Are you, are you praising? Are you reminded of the awesome power of God? Are you ready to declare that he has all authority over, over mind and, and body and soul? If you have, then, then that is where we have to look. But if you're only looking for these miracles that come for the body to think that God is working, then you are missing most of what God is doing. Ho, oh, ho. What a depressed people we would be if we only were looking at the outer signs for hope. Oh, what a burdensome people we'd be if we had to see with our own eyes to believe. If you're here today and you're still carrying a debt and the weight of sin. You can be free. You can be free and you can be forgiven and you can be secured that if you were to die today, you would find a place at heaven's gates by simply believing in Jesus Christ and the Son of God and asking and confessing your sin. At the end of the service, I'm going to be down here, but there's others in this room that can talk to you. If you are here today and you want to be certain that you've received the miracle of believing in Jesus, I want to talk to you. I'll be down here in the front. I'd love to talk with you. If you're here and you already got that miracle and you don't got anything important to say, leave me alone so I can talk to those people that do, okay? If you're here and, and, and you need to talk to maybe one of the people that were on the stage or Pastor Mac or, or, or Chris or one of the other people that are here, one of our deacons, we want to talk to you because we don't want you to miss what I believe is the greatest miracle, that God could take all of our sin and wash it away. But I also want you to know that this miracle of God's restoration of this paralytic, the focus was here. So that you may know, verse six of chapter nine, so that you may know that the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He told the paralytic to get up. So that you may know Jesus still heals. Our God still heals. There are people that have been on the brink of death and by the power of God only have been healed. There are some that are sitting among you that have been healed of ailments and, and frustrations and points and, and depressions and hurts and, and things of the mind and things of the heart and things of the body. And they've been healed and there are living, walking testimony that their healing is also by the same God who heals them of their soul. Oh, he is the greatest shepherd of our soul, the one who wants to hold us and nurture us and walk us into a life of abundance. 
Do you know? So I ask you, what is the most amazing thing to you? Forgiveness of sin or the healing of the paralytic man? What makes you go, whoa? If you're here today and you look at this and you go, Jesus did what? Man, he, he healed somebody and they're, they're walking again. I, I can't believe that, man. Well, Jesus did what? And today you begin to understand that Jesus is sovereign. He has authority over the human body and the mind and the soul. Praise God. Because when you leave this place, you need a God in this moment, in this time, who can help you in your mind, in your body, in your soul. And we have a God who can help us in our mind, in our body, in our soul. And there's a lot of things that have been brought forth in this world, but I'm telling you, if you don't know Jesus Christ, your Savior and Lord, if you don't have a God who is helping with your mind, body, and soul, you are never going to be whole. If you're here today, and the most amazing thing for you, the most amazing thing for you was like, whoa, Jesus forgives sins. Wow. And you have an opportunity. You have an opportunity to go and leave this place and be a bearer of good news. A bearer of good news in, in which, which you can help to tell others about this Jesus Christ, son of a living God, author and perfecter of our faith. Someone, someone who forgives sin. I believe in Jesus. And I believe Jesus forgave me of my sins. And I pray that Jesus will heal my body and my mind, my soul. And I, hate, I hope that you believe that too. Whoa, Capernaum, full of miracles. But it's only if we believe that Jesus is sovereign and has authority if we'll really get to experience the miracles in today's life. Would you stand with me? I want to close this in prayer. If you're here this morning and you are someone who wants to talk and to pray or or to see that God wants to do something in your life, I'll be right down here. Pastor Mac will be here. There's others that will be around the room. I hope that you'll join us for our, our small groups in which we dig into this and talk about a little bit and see these miracles and how, how they mean something to our life this morning. If you need a, a handout and a devotional to walk us through, you can get one on the welcome desk on your way out. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you are amazing. You are the author of life. And you gave us your son, Jesus Christ, to show us who you are and how gracious and, and, and wonderful you are. Lord, let us not slip into the mind of the scribes where we limit your sovereignty and authority in our life. Father, let us, as people who are standing here today, let us be a people who recognize that you are a God that has no limits. And in your, your goodness and your mercy, Lord, you have offered us forgiveness and you offered restoration for our mind and our body and our soul. And Father, I pray for those that are here. They're struggling. They're hurting. They, they need a miracle. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would move into their life, that you would continue to press into them, that you would just give them hope, Father, that you would give them life, Father, that you would help them to have a community of people around them, Father, that could help them to carry the burden that they're carrying, Father. And Father, I pray, Lord, that you would give them the desire of their heart so that they may glorify you and declare that you are a God who is amazing. Lord, I'm thankful for the people that are gathered here, Lord. Let, let their own, own faith and desire to come before you in praise, Lord, continue to move on their lips. And Father, for those of us who will face things this week, things that we don't even know yet, things that are, that are waiting, that are, that are crouching, Lord, that are, that, are, that are right around the corner, Lord, please 
provide us the power to stand against the faces of what would come for us. Father, we pray resiliency into the hearts and lives of the teenagers and the, the, the kids and the, the families and the parents and the grandparents and the singles here, Father, and the, those that are, that are married and those that are unmarried, Lord, those that are, that are distracted, those that are hurting, Lord, those that are going through relational crisis, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would gird them and support them and, and lift them and that your word, Lord, would offer them hope in whatever midst of circumstance they're in. Lord, I thank you that you are a great God. And Lord, we call unto you, Almighty Father, and we give you praise and honor. And we all declared in this word, amen.